when sculpture makes a statue from rock. It's much easier to make a statue from big solid rock rather than from another statue. And welcome everyone to SlaterPod. Joining us today is Konstantin Savinkov, CEO and co-founder of Intento. So Intento helps companies utilize best fit machine translation services and technology. Hi, Konstantin. Hi, Florian. So where does this podcast find you today? What city, uh, what country? It's uh, my home office at uh, Berkeley, California. Berkeley, California on the West Coast, hub for all things tech, of course. So give us the elevator pitch for Intento. We've had a few conversations offline, of course. Uh, you presented our conference. So tell us a bit more about Intento so our listeners can kind of get a better understanding early on what the company does. I think a basic way to describe that would be that we enable global companies to translate about 20 times more on the same budget, um, as you said, by using Clever machine translation. So we have enterprise machine translation hub, which augments this best of breed custom and empty platforms with uh, things like source quality improvement, automatic post editing, and it integrates it with um, existing software in localization, translation management systems, but also in customer experience, employee experience, and other business processes. Also, we um, give a way to monitor translation performance and production to continuously improve uh, the whole language operation stack. That's what we do. That's what you do. So I think we first spoke way back in like 2018, but I think uh, you guys started in about 2017. So how did you come across this, this area of kind of machine learning and, and AI? And why did you think this was a, a good path to pursue? Me and uh, my co-founder, we did some AI things in <laughs> different companies. Uh, not all of them were successful. We started to notice that, you know, when AI doesn't work for business, it, not, it doesn't always about AI. It's very often about boring things like integrations, uh, how it works with humans, uh, vendor selection, data cleaning, and things like that. And we understood that actually nobody focuses on those boring things. Company services, companies do, integrators, but there is no software product for that. So we decided to build such a product, like an integration platform. We started from thinking, you know, we are engineers. We started thinking, okay, integration is the biggest issue because even to evaluate, say, 20 machine translation engines, you need to have integrations with all of them, which few companies had back then. So we started from developing the integration technology, we patented it, we integrated with OLMT. And then we started to, I think about the same time Gartner recognized us, we started to work with large enterprises and we started to navigate this industry. <laughs> we figured out that, okay, uh, if we can integrate with OLMT systems, then we need to figure out which, with which ones to which, one, which ones to use in production. So we started to work on evaluation side and build tools for that. Then uh, I think it was late 2018, uh, we got domain adaptation, we got glossaries for neural machine translation. So we went very far into customizing machine translation. Then we got this very typical, you know, pre-chasm situation for startups when you have you know, a dozen of customers, all of them have different use cases. So if you figure a way how to consolidate it. So we started to um, build a few specific products like for localization solutions, let me say on top of this platform, for localization, for customer service, for community content, for uh, digital workplace productivity. Uh, we built lots of connectors. And I think the, the most recent development is that, you know, if you have lots of use cases connected to the same set of anti-models, like some of our customers have, I think, as many as 30, then you have to think what you do with this uh, empty model zoo. And you don't want to have a model per use case because it's hard to manage. And to have a few models for many use cases, you need to find a way how you feed 
existing model to a specific use case. And then we started to develop these things around automatic post editing so that we're not training the model for a specific you know system. We're more adding some edits on top uh, to fit. Yeah, that's um, that's that's how we got where we are. What's interesting about Intento also is that you do both product and services, right? So, for example, you do some empty evaluation, as you just mentioned, maintenance services, but you also have uh, some of the products you just described, or like you know, like the MT Hub and the MT Studio. How do you manage the two, right? Typically, it's it's very hard to do both. Like on the one hand, kind of develop a roadmap and have like a a product. Uh, focus, but on the other hand, also being like super responsive on the services side to the customer. Like, how do you how do you manage this? The services are purely <clears throat> supportive to software. Now, the way we're thinking about that is, uh, you may think that like a customer problem is this complex hole in the ground, and if you pick off the shelf AI tools, it's basically like big blocks. You can see a couple of blocks in this hole, but there will be lots of space left. So for this space left, we develop our own software, which just has more nuanced form. And then we still have some space left and we fill it with services. So we have about, I think we earn about 10 to 15% of revenue from services, which is quite low. And I think it's it's about this uh, amount any software company uh, has. So what we do in services, we, um, we do, post-dating analytics, which we call localization checkup, which just helps to identify bottlenecks in uh, this deep localization stack. Like, like like a healthcare provider, when you come, <clears throat> they do checkup for you, right? So that's that's one thing. As you said, we also customize and evaluate models. And then we have uh, this recurring um, service to maintain those models over time where we do model updates, we monitor model changes, model updates done by MT providers. And we also do this periodic um, MT performance uh, analysis so that our customers may update their uh, terms with uh, language service providers as their MT improves. And all that we gradually, as we develop new service, we see a new service, we 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 run it manually for a while, but then we are adding automation. So we have MT Studio, which actually a platform to automate MT customization and evaluation, where you can just customize models in the same interface and then uh, calculate scores and uh, extract uh, data for uh, human review. And um, we have more internal tools. So basically our service is highly automated. We're, uh, we see we, we cannot go without them because we work with large enterprise. It's very company to company, very different, requires uh, analysis. But we want to leave only decision-making to people. So we're uh, all leg work, we automate. You mentioned the deep localization stack and I was gonna ask you like why is there such an incredible variety of like different machine translation, TMS, CAT tools out there? Like why? Why is there literally dozens and dozens and dozens of different tools? What, what's, what's, yeah, what's the reason for that? I think it's pretty natural to software world, right? Like you have probably hundreds of uh, CRM systems, CMS systems, well, video recording software systems because uh, th that's how it works. Uh, business is a complex thing where lots of people doing things together um, and split in different teams. And software, when it's firstly written, it fits business process only so much and then over time it fits better. And then since every company has slightly different business processes, one software works better for it and another don't, especially again for enterprises, which are really different one from each other. So regarding TMS and CAD tools, that's pretty clear. That's the reason and it happens with every software. So there is pretty much no consolidation. Um, more like better software fits into business process as soon as you fit more into one business process, you create basically a niche for your competitor to fit better for another. And for AI, it's for AI, it's a bit different. We've seen different 
different things in the past. I think the whole venture industry was a bit, uh, you know, shocked by the OCR story, right? When uh, at the dawn of the technology there were dozens of different vendors. Now it's pretty much two or three. And the reason for that is quite simple. It's actually, the, it, it puzzles many investors, but the reason is very simple because you have only so many letters, right? <laughs> Uh, what you can do 30 years with 26 letters, well, uh, your creativity starts to, you know, fade out at some point. And with language, it's more similar to software, I believe. Because what we see in translation, uh, as translation gets better, um, you, can, you know, I can, I can tell this story. So we're analyzing with this... Um, Check up. We're analyzing with one customer how postdated distance goes down year by year, and at some point we've seen year by year it didn't go down. So we start to analyze why, because we now we build much better machine translation for them. And we found the reason is that because part of the content they were post-editing actually went to raw machine translation, so it went out of this you know post-editing scope, but then some new content which they never post-edited because they deemed it to be too complex, it actually started to be post-edited. That sort of shows how machine translation basically gets closer to high, high impact content. And as it gets closer to high impact content, then you see more requirements, new requirements uh, to machine translation. And then if you look uh, how, I mean, we work with many empty vendors, so I see that, okay, they, they, they spent um, significant resources on these general frameworks, but it feels that they spent much more effort into polishing and adjusting solution for a specific uh, industries and specific use cases and languages, and that's where this tree starts to branch more and more. That, that, that's why I believe we see uh, every year we see more and more new machine translation providers, 54 at the moment, and they all find business. It's not that there's just, you know, hypothesis founded by venture capitalists. Some of them do, some of them are, but typically they find business. I think the 54 number is probably from your uh, State of Machine Translation 2022 report, uh, which is uh, really interesting. And I think it's become like uh, one of the key things to look forward to in the in the MT world every year. So the most recent one came out a couple of months ago. I mean, what were some of the maybe top two, three most surprising kind of interesting things that you gather from that latest edition? The most interesting thing, uh, I think it's uh, the data set which is the best we ever had. First, because it, it, it's very dense. It covers nine domains for every of 11 language pairs we evaluated, most popular ones, which we prepared together with E2F. And no one seen this data set before, so it's not from any sort of public source or um, you know, data set sold to some of the empty vendors. So it's very fresh. That's why some of the rankings are different from what we've seen before. Um, that's uh, very important. Um, then um, language pair support continues to surprise us. Um, 125,000 language pairs. And I think if we count languages, more than 400. And just after the report was published, we got, I think, more than 20 new languages from Google. And just last week, another 24 languages from Alibaba, which are new to our platform. So we never seen those languages. They're extremely low resource. So that's, that's I think, very important. And it's good to see that it's still booming. We still, you know, empty providers still adding new, new languages. And finally, I think the very routing, you know, the, the the result of the report is routing. If we say that, okay, if you don't have money to invest into training your models or running evaluation with humans, well, if that's your domain, probably that engine off the shelf stock model would work best for you. 
And we see there are some things we see in um, you know commercial evolutions as well as that for some domains like entertainment, you have to customize most likely because their relative performance of stock models is quite low, probably because of the diversity of this uh, domain. Then you may see the same for colloquial uh, content. But for colloquial content, it's hard to train model. Typically, you don't have to translate it, right? So that's where we actually we, we use automatic post-editing for that, so that based on the metadata of people talking, we can um, edit translation to, to make it into the right tone of voice, the right gender, and things like that. Let's go a little bit to the kind of use case. Uh, I, what, when I browse through the website, uh, one of the things I found really interesting is uh, the, the browser extension, right? Uh, so that you provide. So for improved collaboration between, I think in, in the case on the website it was like game developing, uh, game development teams. This is probably under your like digital workplace productivity kind of umbrella, right? But can you just talk me through how people are using this, how it works, um, you know, like which teams would would would, uh, would would use this? One of the, I think, big trends in uh, translation localization and uh, if you will, like a uh, tailwind <laughs> in this industry is that uh, companies start to realize that um, they may sell in one language, but their teams may speak many. And it's it's about inclusivity. It's about uh, you know having people uh, feeling good at workplace, but also it's about productivity. And this translation, which is uh, to help teams cooperate, one of these examples which we mentioned, we work with few game development companies. They typically have uh, engineers in different countries. And not all of these countries uh, even ready to accept uh, talking English or another single language because engineers, you know, they're sometimes hard to approach with this. Go right in English, especially in countries like France, Japan, um, Eastern Europe. So that's that's the solution. Uh, we we have this browser extension, a sort of wildcard connector. Like if you think you have translation in Google Chrome, right? But it mostly builds to translate websites like static pages. And it also uses this stock stock model, which you cannot uh, customize. And also when it's about internal communications, the content may be a bit too sensitive. No one wants to be next uh, stat oil or standard oil. What was that? Stat oil, I believe. That was stat oil, the Norwegian one, yeah. That had all it all that stuff online, yeah. Yes. So we built this extension. It's basically it's a, it's another connector to the hub. It um, translates web applications, not web pages. So it works pretty nicely with things like Asana and uh, this all this Web 2.0 stuff. And uh, we also have um, customized connectors. So what we discovered with engineers, okay, they use desktop software. Now what you do with your browser extension desktop, so we had to develop desktop connector, which enables uh, translation of des desktop software applications like Visual Studio and some others. Then we built connectors to uh, Atlassian ecosystem because of that. And uh, it's it's extremely um, um, demanded. So there's very strong pull from those teams. Although before they, some of them never heard about machine translation. Actually, interesting thing. So I mentioned that it used by a few game development companies. It also um, used for other types of employee experience by the clients. And interestingly, it actually what we see it creates. Um, it increases footprint of localization team as well. And it helps localization team to find, uh, where, you know, when localization team starts to serve IT people, IT people typically have much bigger IT budget because they are IT people. <laughs> so it actually increases uh, capacity of the localization team because suddenly they have uh, resources to train models to invest in software, to make, to do more automation. 
to, as I mentioned, to translate much more than they they used to uh, before. Very, very interesting. I, I, I like this use case. It's very, um, yeah, frontier and probably really complex to pull off if you have to do it as a plugin, but also to desktop. Uh, a lot of engineering going into that. Um, can we just talk briefly about Google's translation hub? Uh, you wrote a really interesting uh, blog post about it on your uh, Medium um, blog, uh, which I recommend everybody to to go and visit. So what are some of the pros and cons of like, in your view, kind of big tech coming in and offering an enterprise product like this? I think marketing here is a little bit confusing in this <laughs> particular case, because um, I think Gartner introduced a category of uh, AI hub in their market guide a couple of years back, which is pretty much about what our hub does, meaning that connecting to few AI systems, connecting to few enterprise software systems, and doing some augmentation in the middle. Um, Google Enterprise Translation Hub, I would call it um, Document Translation Portal in 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 the industry lingo so we also have it uh, it's um it's a good um tra document translation portal meaning that which basically extends google translate to the enterprise where you can use your custom models you can uh, translate text you can translate files documents you have convenient access to them um, it's interesting that Google added uh, some mini TMS system to this hub, which is, it's not new because Google had translation toolkit, if I'm not mistaken, uh, years back. And then Microsoft has similar platform where you could use this sort of post-editing interface to, uh, to enhance models. So it's not the first attempt to do that. I think it still will, well, know the industry, uh, TMS, new, T, new TMS lacking many features brought by customer. Well, it, it, it needs to be into, at least integrated with uh, TMS systems of language service providers. We'll see how it goes. We see some companies actually go this road. Uh, for example, ServiceNow, they have a localization framework. It has some TMS integrations, so we'll see. Um, and another interesting feature is quality estimation, um, so that for every segment translated through Google Hub, you have um, quality estimation, how good I think it works. Uh, we we tested it just a little bit. We found the same probably uh, the same uh, feature of which you found at every quality estimation system is that overall the picture is more or less, uh, if you average, gives a get, get good understanding of the document translated good way or needs lots of editing. But if you look at every specific segment, you may see that this estimate is a bit off for some segments, which sort of confirmed by um, companies developing MTQE, like Model Front and then Bubble is that um, it requires customization. Just had a workshop last week uh, about that. Do you think they're gonna? I mean, it looks like they're maybe one third in, maybe getting to like halfway. Do, do you expect them to make another major push? Them being Google, like, and really starting to add features, starting to maybe even have a little bit of a sales force that's kind of pushing this particular line of products more aggressively, or? Do you feel like that's what we have here that's going to be like this for the next two to three years? I think it highlights your important direction. I think in the past, if you look at machine translation provided by large cloud computing vendors, it mostly was um, like, I feel, I feel, let me say this way, I feel it was more like a loss leader, uh, which basically is something which people using cloud instances may need. So let, let's provide it to them to, to, to avoid them going to, to our competitor. It feels like since introduction of um, Google OTML Translate, um, Google is more on track uh, making, tr tr making like a revenue stream out of translation, 
again, it feels like that. I'm not sure. But I see that lots of effort which goes into AutoML is to make actually revenue from translation, hence the price. We see that in the Google uh, Translation Hub, it's another fourfold increase of the price if you calculate, you know, average for count and characters. You unpacked it on your on your blog post. I found that super interesting. That's a sign. So if you see, if if a company like Google adds a margin, you know, margin on top of using their software, means they want they they do lots of things for free, right? Uh, they have so many engineers. So they're starting to charge for software means they want your money, which is, I believe it's super good for the industry in general. Because big companies, and also as you probably see, big capital starts to consider all things translation, suddenly a nice industry. You can earn money there. Good. Let's do it. It's not, and actually the reason, uh, for example, Gartner started to absorb this space as well. It's because it's no longer service industry. Uh, it's suddenly software industry. Now it gets interesting. So that that's a very good sign. I believe that uh, given the effort Google put into this new tool, it will definitely continue to do that. I believe just knowing industry a little bit, it's hard to do that with lack of interoperability on both sides. So um, you have to let... If you want to, if it's an enterprise hub, you have to work with enterprises. They have some legacy, legacy software and models and tools. You have to be interoperable to be successful. I believe that's what we see. I have no idea what they have on the roadmap. Let's say this way. If I would have an idea, I wouldn't tell you. Uh, <laughs> but I believe, yes, I believe that, uh, and I believe we'll see something like that from other companies. Um, definitely. So for you, you work with both the LSPs and the enterprise. Can you just maybe unpack some of the differences that you see between the two segments in terms of requirements and, you know, spinning this, this up for them? We mostly work with enterprise as a customer. We have, uh, maybe a couple of large LSPs, uh, which value us for connecting to many TMS systems at once because they have to work with many. But mostly we work with enterprise and we sometimes work side by side with an LSP. Because there are still many enterprises using bundle solutions like one window, everything at once. They still send files through email to translate. Uh, they don't have access to translation memory. And then at some point, uh, they, the way for, of unbundling, you know, reach them. They're starting to think, oh, we need to have a TMS to manage our own TM. We need to have an uh, LSP separate from TMS and separate from machine translation. And we need to have machine translation. And then quality management and business process management software. And they start to, you know, go from this one big vendor, which does everything for them at huge margin, to managing a portfolio of vendors um, to be much more efficient. So that's what we see a lot. And we see with LS, we work with some LSPs uh, side by side uh, in those projects, but still we, we mostly work with enterprises. Let's go a little bit to uh, what's going on on, uh, I don't know, AI Twitter, I guess you could call it. I've also spoken about it last week with uh, with Scott from, from DeepGram around um, the, all this generative AI, right? And like what's coming via Stable Diffusion, via OpenAI, things like uh, Whisper, which is a speech, uh, hang on, text-to-speech, right? Speech-to-text um, uh, model. Like, do you think with these large language models, we're like, we're in a another breakthrough, like akin to maybe the kind of all you, um, attention is all you need 2017 neural machine translation breakthrough, or where do you, where do you see this right now? And, and, and how would this influence, if at all, the machine translation space? We make three things here. Uh, so one thing is uh, massive multilingual models which is a thing and um, we see it more and more. 
it's actually start to be used in production and that's the way how how you get why you can suddenly afford supporting low restless languages because you, you you're doing get more resources for them but you can boost them using big languages that's massive multilingual models like second thing is um pre -tra large pre-trained models available to the audience which is stable diffusion and then gpt is type of this model um comet is is based based on top of view dirt laser Excelnet, uh, some others that's that's a very important thing so it enables people built on top and um it enables them to do it with uh, few data resources so with very little amount of data that's another important trend and i, th I think here it's more development of technology to train and run those models and also access to capital which is ready to sponsor that just uh, it, it takes lots of resources and the third thing which is generative ai and so whisper is more type of this big pre-trained model it's not generative ai it's not multilingual well it's it is but uh not not i believe not in massive multilingual um sense it feels like i may be wrong you need to ask my co-founder <laughs> Now, generative AI is, uh, it, it's all started, I believe, with, uh, well, recent history with GPT-3. Then a few other models followed from big companies. Then open source models followed. <clears throat> then we've seen it for images, right? So stable diffusion, mid-journey, DALI. Um, we're starting to see it for video from Facebook, so it starts to be multi-model, interesting. Um, and that's, I think, this one, uh, I see two, 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 two very important big impacts. First, things like GPT and other pretend models, they actually enable, well, they enable us and other technology providers to go outside machine translation. We can do, you know, same language transformations for source quality improvement which we presented some work at low court, which we've done together with VMware. Uh, we able to do automatic post editing using those tools. And this is great because company like ours would, it would take lots of time while we got resources to build such models from scratch ourselves. Now we can build on top. Um, I believe generative AI actually will have much more impact on the industry, which we may not realize yet but if you think um if you even double the amount of content because ai helps to create it what does it mean for for localization industry well it means probably x20 so you need to translate all this content and now if the cost to produce content is lower you will you be using expensive human translation for that well, most likely not you'll, you'll be looking for other ways i believe that this there's a big wave in gentrify ai with those jasper fundraise a few weeks back and some others coming they're not public i know about them i won't tell you <laughs> but then what we'll see that after these new ai tools you know, started to impact the upstream, the content generation industry, authoring, content authoring industry, then we'll see like tsunami in the translation services because of that. And that's, that's very exciting. You mentioned we got the um, massive multilingual, right? We got on the, on the one side, which actually we just had an article, like even a bank, like BMP Paribas, they're like training the massive multilingual models now, they figured this out. Uh, so this is core kind of machine translation space. Then you have um, <clears throat> these um, GPT-3 large language models. Um, and then the, uh, again, the generative AI side, but just for the machine translation 
use case? Like, aren't some of these or these more advanced language models and generative things, wouldn't machine translation be like an emergent property of them? Like, couldn't, couldn't you use them to do machine translation as well, but just not highly trained? Or like, why, you know, why would we have to rely on these somewhat older approaches like, you know, massive multilingual now that we have these uh, newer, like super breakthrough approaches to doing things? Maybe I'm formulating a question wrong, but I'm just like trying, hopefully f interesting for the audience as well, like trying to wrap our heads around all the stuff that's happening right now. It's a good question. Uh, one of the, I think there are two main reasons for that. So one reason is, uh, as I mentioned, I think lots of effort going into fitting specific machine translation tool to the purpose by the vendor, but specific language pairs use cases requirements to translations and those bare bone models they come without that meaning that if, if you take uh, no language left behind you will miss many features uh, compared to your what, what you use today because you probably want to have inline tag support you want uh, you won't have glossaries and customization we can which you can run relatively in a simple way and you want translations to be stable. You don't want it to be, you know, you want it to be reliable. And that's you're not getting from those systems out of the box. So that's why I, I, I'm not a huge believer in open source machine translation for the end user. For technology companies, yes. For end user, it still requires, it's like Visual Studio, um, great tool. Uh, boosted um, engineering a lot, but if you need CRM system, you, you go by CRM system, right? <laughs> so in a sense, you can you can always there's always a huge demand for something just that extra customized customized layer on top of things, right? So maybe these systems could do it, but there's always somebody building something more purpose built. Anyway, yeah, be, because this uh, problem space, the problem is is very complex, which is solved by a business, at least today. Then, uh, second, uh, what I want to say. So, uh, second reason, um, maybe I forgot it. <laughs> Sorry, I threw you off there. One of the things is that um, you have to. Um, uh, you need something more end user, uh, and it, it it's not there yet. And uh, maybe that's the main that's that's the main reason. But they used they used in on the back end. They are already used multi massive multilingual models. They used by some of the MT providers on the back end. And they they you know they affect the industry, but not not as an alternative. The whole massive multilingual is something that I had a really hard time to wrap my head around over the past two to three years because it's always been like, okay, it's there, it's kind of the default, but if you still hardcore and laser focused train something that's not massive multilingual, we're still going to be slightly better. But I think now we're starting to see this becoming kind of the default. Yes. And actually, I remember the second thing, and that's the rest of massive multilingual. So if you think, so very important thing for enterprises is what's called change management. So you put something in production, um, you run acceptance testing, but not, then things change. So you have new data, business processes change, you launch new products, or the world changes, the language changes. Uh, you change your software systems integrated with this thing because you, you probably use like hundreds of hundreds of them and like if you think in software world you like microservice architectures where you have many services and the main reason for that is not that the whole thing works better no the whole thing works worse <laughs> but the change management is better because you can have a separate team a separate vendor developing each of those services. It's easier to uh, find mistakes. Sometimes you find bugs because you change some other place of the system. It's easier to 
isolate them and fix them. And it is easy to manage the whole thing. It's easy to scale the whole thing. And if I will tell you today for massive multi-service software architecture, you tell me, look, that's like monolithical dinosaur software system. We should not go this way. So that's something for the industry still to solve is if you have um, this massive multilingual model, so if you update it with data from one use case in one language, it affects all your, all your 40 software systems connected to this uh, machine translation and all your 100,000 100, employees and a billion users speaking in 400 languages, what you do with this change management. So I believe what we'll see over time is like a layer on top of this massive multilingual models, which enables very simple versioning and um, change propagation and things like that. And that's like another example of what it takes to put this model to real production. It's not something you get from neural network. It's, it's engineering needs to be done by someone and managed by someone, maintained by someone. So before you mentioned that you presented at Lockworld, which uh, I think it was about a week ago, that you said source text improvement. That sounds really interesting. Could you just tell us a bit more uh, about that? Yeah, so that was actually a past Lockworld. At last Lockworld, we presented other things. <laughs> but uh, so that's about, you know, we, we had... Um, when we when we run this post dating analysis to identify you know where are the bottlenecks and what to fix in machine translation, we found a problem which you cannot fix with machine translation, which is transcreation, because from a machine translation standpoint, it's not a translation; it's just two different sentences. So you cannot train it on it, just because it's it's not a bilingual sentence; it's not a parallel sentence, right? Then we notice interesting thing is uh, uh, this because typically you think that transgression is in two target local, right? That okay, you want it to be more local, so you you transcreate it. We notice that those transcreations done by German and Japanese translators are actually very similar, and we realize that wow, what those guys are doing, they're actually transcreating from. American locale rather than two other locales, which means the source is uh, maybe not international. It it requires some adaptation before it can be easily translated to other languages. Which sort of brings this idea of source quality improvement: is that what if we use different tools to make to get rid of this hard to translate? Americanisms and make it more general. Uh, like, I mean, good, 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 like, good, like translating American marketing copy with a home run into Japanese. So, and things like that, or CXO as a senior management personnel, hard to translate to many languages because it's, it's slang. That's we we experimented with GPT three to improve. Uh, the source. We experimented with some other tools. Looks promising. Um, I hope we'll run some production pilots with that. Hang on. So you neutralize like the cultural ladenness essentially of like an English source copy and then you can still machine translate it and maybe add like some other layer on top and then you get a much more like free liberal version of the actual or origin yeah much more post editable source that's my big criticism always when i look at like translations from like us english into german which is my native language it's just o always over the top it is too verbal it's just uh, it's too informal right and that's just it's very very hard for a machine to get this right because you have to really depart from the source but yeah i mean we could spend another hour on this topic of course, if you just machine translate it, you will get, uh, it will not be very nuanced local copy. But you may think that like, you know, like uh, when sculptor uh, makes a statue from rock, right? 
remove some parts. It's much easier to make a statue from big solid rock rather than from another statue. That's a good one. That's a great metaphor. If you get a piece of marketing art, of US marketing art, as a starting point, it's super hard for you to get a piece of Japanese marketing card. So maybe you prefer to have this block. And if you look at companies with lots of resources, that's what they do. So Google presented at one of the conferences, it was maybe five years back, six, that they use few different English uh, copies. One of them is international, others for like US, UK, the English speaking markets. So what, what we do, we, we, you know, we form a big solid rock for a post editor to, 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 to craft the art. That is a beautiful way of thinking about it. And also something that, uh, yeah, makes the autom automatability, I guess, of trans creation a bit more feasible. Interesting. Thank you. I, uh, never thought about it that way. That's, uh, definitely learning something here. Um, is, is that on your maybe product roadmap for the next 12 to 18 months, anything kind of productizing in that area, or is there anything else you can share with us exclusively on the pod today? We have, uh, uh, a bit, a bit of an issue. Some time ago we were about, oh, let's use many empty systems. That's where you need intent to, well, we're more and more into many of our customers use just one vendor, uh, because they work with one language pair. But still, they need to have this machine translation to be connected to their software tools. And also, they need this. It needs to be better. That's it. And you cannot do it by training. That's what we know uh, after a certain, certain point. So we are, we are working a lot. We'll be working a lot in two directions. One of them is um, just connecting to more enterprise systems, making better connectors to systems like Salesforce, ServiceNow, uh, and likes. We already have, but we need to do more. And second big direction is, we already have probably around 20, I think, these automatic post-editing features on top of MT and source quality improvement. And we'll be doing more for more use cases, um, we, you know, we, we have, for example, tone of voice control and gender control and um, um, so ability to manage those the, the, those sides of translation. Uh, we think that sometimes there are more nuanced requirements right at the register of translation or style. We'll be looking there. Um, and that, yeah, that, that's where we're heading. Uh, and, you know, I see that, funny thing I see is, much like translators a few years back, they were, oh, don't, it, it's machine. How, how can machine touch, you know, the, the human words? We see about the same feed, initial feedback from copywriters and content authors. They're saying, okay, you can send our content to machine translation. We're good about that, but don't touch it. Don't touch the words. The words which are sent to, the words which are sent to machine translation should be the same words. It should not be touched by another machine. There were, well, but is it a big difference? <laughs> I thought that the dialogue of the past few months on, on, uh, on some, some of these commentary from the writers and the authors was very similar to like five years ago on the translator side, very kind of similar, also anxiety, frankly. And I think the translation world has moved, um, it's, it's quite advanced in kind of adapting to, uh, to AI generally, of course. Uh, yeah, the statue, that's gonna, that's gonna stay with me. Uh, the statue, the block, not, not doing a, a statue from another statue. <laughs> I'll remember that metaphor. All right. Constant, it was fantastic having you on the podcast today. Thank you so much. Thanks, Florian. Thank you. Bye-bye.